for your matches. Why do you record these? So that you can watch them again and again later. Three space, three dimensional space. Yeah, uh, so the three dimensional coordinate system is maybe something you've encountered in your life before, I'm not sure. Um, I have X, Y, Z. There is a definite, yeah, it makes sense that we have a third coordinate. And um, it's a little hard to see the coordinate system, but it's pretty good. It's a little hard to picture coordinates. Forget like graphs, forget like complicated curves in three dimensions, it's hard to just even picture one point in three dimensions on, on a two-dimensional screen like this. So um, just like back in elementary school, or no, when did, middle school, whenever you learned like how to first plot the point seven, two in two dimensions, you remember you were like, okay, seven, two, there it is. You remember doing that like kind of thing? Like, like that. This is basically the same thing, only in three dimensions. So instead of like creating a rectangle, we've created a rectangular prism to picture where the point is. And it's not just cosmetic here. It's really, it's actually kind of needed here, isn't it? Because if those aren't there, then that point x, y, z, if you had just had it floating there, you wouldn't actually know which octant it's in. Is it in this one here facing us? Or is it like, how, what's our depth here? You know, you, it's hard to tell. Do you see what I mean? Like it wasn't there. You can tell this is in the positive, in the uh, first octant here. But. Yeah, but it could be if it weren't for that box there, you wouldn't maybe know. Whatever. So good. this is good art practice. I don't know that we'll make we'll expect you on a test or something to draw that picture, but <laughs> but it's good practice for those who have like visual skills. You so you can draw that picture. Good job. <laughs> I like the challenge of it. Okay, that's good. And it would be harder, actually, to, to find, to locate a point in one of the other octaves, actually. <laughs> we can, obviously, the thing we most care about talking about in this particular unit is, is how vectors might show up in three, the third dimension, too. So, um, All the things we've already talked about are things we can still do in higher dimensions, too. So, for example, the magnitude, you remember this formula? We can just add one more component to it, and there you go. Done. Okay. Or say the dot product. We just learned about that. So there you go. Just add a third component. I think you would have done these things even if I hadn't told you to. You probably would have been like, yeah, I think that's probably how it goes. And you'd be right. Or how about the angle between two vectors? The formula there I have just copied. It's the same formula, obviously. Um, but now, given the previous two things I've just said, does it make sense how to take the magnitude of these vectors or how to take the dot product if they're three-dimensional vectors? Sure. And in three dimensions, does it make sense? Can we talk about the angle between two vectors? Yeah. And it comes out to be the same thing. So cool. So far, really, actually, in some ways, nothing new. Uh, I think I promised this was coming, right? We have a name for the unit vector in the, the z direction. It's k, 0, 0, 1, right? So now i, we might consider i to be 1, 0, 0, j to be 0, 1, 0, and now k also, 0, 0, 1. I'll let you digest that for a second. Are we good on that? Is that cool? What do you think? What do you think of three dimensions? What do you think? Yeah, it's projection. The projection of the k vector onto the x y plane is the zero vector. And we do mean projection. We won't do projections in three dimensions, but I think it'd be worth it. I think yeah, good I had a I had a young lady do uh, an IA with with um, you know doing perspective drawing and it was very complicated actually. You know she had like a plane that which she was projecting three dimensions to figure out how to draw. It's cool. Actually very complicated even though it's easy to talk about. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know you now know how to calculate the magnitude of even a four or five dimensional vector. You just keep adding in, in the same way. More components. It doesn't mean anything? Why not? Well, I mean, to a mathematician, um, or to anyone maybe, uh, a, a higher dimensions just means um, a list of, like, more and more characteristics, right? More things we're measuring about something. So, so if something has, like... Yeah, yeah. How would you visualize it? Like, I mean, an example of... Uh, an example of like, here's a, an example of a five-dimensional vector, right? Um, imagine you were trying to describe the temperature at, at, at every point in this room throughout the day, right? On this day, okay? How would you, how would you have to list that? Well, you would really need five dimensions to name, to, to be able to list that information, wouldn't you? For this particular point in the room, you'd need three spatial dimensions just to describe this point in the room, X, Y, and Z, yes? But then you need another dimension for the temperature. And you need another dimension for the time when it was that temperature, right? That's five dimensions. Now, how could you picture that besides like talking about it and thinking about it? Um, I don't know. Maybe you do like an animation with color or something, right? You have like a heat map where red and red is hot and blue is cool, and you'd show me a video over the course of maybe a time lapse video of the room, and I'd be able to actually see all five dimensions. But it, it does take maybe because we're like three dimensional people. It does take like also adding color and animation to help us with the, the extra two dimensions. Like add a fourth plane on that, right? Like, like mm, I don't know where it would go, right? Yeah. Yeah, you, know, you can't really add another. It'd be hard to see. But. People have come up with all sorts of ways of helping us visualize higher dimensions. Um, all right, well, practice time. Ready to go. So I'll call on a couple of people, and in, in, uh, I'll give you two or minutes or so to, to try these new operations in this new context.
I mean, apparently, right? I mean, I asked the question. We believe in you. Um, it's interesting, in two dimensions, if I give you a vector, it's very easy to picture other vectors that might be perpendicular to my vector, right? There aren't very many options, really. They all lie along like a single line, kind of, right? Um, so what, what do we mean when we, if I have a, a vector that I own in three dimensions, um, and you come along and you want to like place another vector in, in, in there somehow, so that it's perpendicular, uh, where could you put it? You, it seems like maybe you have some more options, don't you? So here's my vector. Where is your vector going to go? It's perpendicular to mine. Yeah, it could go here, right? That's certainly perpendicular, forms a 90 degree angle. Where else could it go? Yeah, it seems like there maybe is like a, a whole circle of options, isn't there? And actually the magnitude is up for grabs too. So really, you could really, maybe not just a, a single circle, right? But really, every year. Really, like everything. Like, what does it determine? Like, what, what, what's actually being determined by a set of vectors that are all perpendicular to my vector? Yeah, maybe a plane of some kind, right? They all kind of lie, lie in the same plane almost, right? So, all the vectors would be perpendicular to my vector. So, we have more options in three dimensions. So, I just want to make sure you're picturing in your mind what it would mean for, like, for B, for these two vectors to be perpendicular. Is that a thing that can happen? Yeah. In fact, it's. There may be lots of ways to have that happen in three dimensions. All right, so lots of good stuff on this slide. You're using, you're getting used to i, j, and k. You're like, you're getting used to taking the dot product. You're getting used to uh, understanding this orthogonal niche of, for three-dimensional vectors. You know how to do head minus tail and find component form, and you use practice doing the magnitude too. Okay, great. Now let's ruin all of this, right? So all of that is still. All of that is still stuff kind of that we've been doing before, just extended to the third dimension. We now have the opportunity to introduce to you a new operation, though, that we can only define in three dimensions. Like, we really do have to wait until this lesson, this day, in order to talk about the cross product, which is another way of, quote unquote, multiplying vectors. I, we want to shy away from using that word, though, here, but we're going to define another kind of multiplication. It's like a vector product. Two vectors will take and we'll multiply them together and we'll get another vector. Okay. And it'll have special properties that we'll describe here, though, too. Uh, and I should say, this only works in dimension three. It doesn't work in higher or lower dimensions. Okay. Now, don't be scared. All right, with it, I want to, I know, you're like, what is that thing? I know, I know. You're like, what is that thing? Okay. Um, all right, so this is, now this thing, the, 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 these are made more difficult in my life because you haven't had a background in matrices, um, but it, it's, it's really fine. Life is actually going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine, okay? Um, I'll just, okay, just hold my hand. Okay, so that's a, it's called a three by three matrix, and actually those vertical bars in this particular case are calling for us to take something called the determinant of this matrix. So you don't actually have to know those words or anything like that, but um, but we are going to show you how to take a 3 by 3 determinant, even though like this is somewhat contextless. 
Um, we'll circle back someday and like hit this again and, and do some more with matrices. Uh, mark my word. Okay. So, but right now it's machinery. Okay. Just trust me on this. So to take a three by three determinant. Uh, again, this just looks like a bunch of letters. I apologize, but um, once I break this down, you'll see what's going on. Are you ready? So we're going to take this. Mate, that you're going to circle. You don't have to circle it actually, but just picture I here and crossing out the row in the column that I is in. And then the thing that remains is like this little square matrix, two by two. This minus is not a typo. There is a minus there. And then same deal with J, right? If you were imagine just focusing on J and crossing out its row and its column, then here and here we have a matrix that is kind of what we're writing down there, the, the, the one that's left over. These are called minors. The minors of this matrix with respect to this row. And then doing the same thing with K, again, kind of crossing off in our mind the row and the column that it's in leaves this matrix behind. And then again, those vertical bars on each of these little two by two matrices indicate that we're asking you to take the determinant of each of those. So now you're gonna learn how to take a, a two by two determinant here to finish the job. And a two by two determinant is you multiplying the diagonal here and subtracting the product of the other diagonal. So this minus this, okay? And that'll help us resolve all of these. And uh, there actually is a typo on this line right here. All better. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so what did I just say? I said A2, B3, right? So that's this diagonal, the product of the main diagonal minus the product of the off diagonal, right? For each one of these, A1, B3, B, uh, A3, B1, right? So that's what we're doing on each one of these is diagonal minus diagonal. And um, so I think that's help more helpful to see like the, my circles and boxes and my diagonal minus diagonal. Hearing that and seeing that is better than like being like, okay, how do I think the, the cross product again? Oh yeah, it's a two b three minus a three b two disaster. Much better to not memorize this formula here. Just like think about the procedure, the, uh, the actual actions, the moves we made as we did the procedure. I think you'll find that there's no like subscripts that you'll have to memorize along the way. Yeah, yeah. So. Down minus up, sure, yeah, I like that. Down minus up, <laughs> right. Um, and and this is a lot of work, right? Well, it seems like it. Actually, it, it doesn't actually, it's in practice, we'll do one in a minute, and you'll see it's actually pretty quick. And in fact, that very, very quickly into this process, you may actually prefer to just do it all in your head. It's not that bad, really, because it's just like this minus this, that's the component for I, this minus this, take the opposite, that's the component for J, this minus this, that's the component for, for K. Right, so you can see how I'm, I'm writing it out here, but in, in, in practice you might get a little fast with this. So, um, why do all this work, and what is the cross product in, when we're done? First of all, it is a vector. It'll be something times i plus something times j plus something times k. It'll be a vector thing, and it has this nice property. This picture shows it. This picture shows it too nicely in an animation. We're crossing the blue and the red, and we get a green vector, which has what interesting property do you think? This picture shows it too. We got blue and red, and we cross those, and we get purple, A cross B here. And it marks them here. It's what? The cross product vector is, what'd you say? Yeah, it's orthogonal to both of the original two vectors. Hopefully both of these pictures are showing you that. The other thing that this one shows you which, and that's actually the most important thing for our purposes in this class, is that we understand that the cross product does, in fact, give us a vector that's orthogonal to both of yours. That's probably the end of the discussion for us. That's all I really care about. But it is interesting to note that when you use the cross product in a physics environment, the magnitude of the cross product matters to us also. Um, and you can see when the cross product has its biggest value and when it has its least value in terms of magnitude. When does that happen? In terms of the blue and red vector, how do we get a big cross product? Do you see it? Watch it spin. Yeah, when, the, when they're at 90 degrees, which is interesting. There was another product we did recently that kind of had the opposite property, didn't it? Do you remember that? But that product, when we're at 90 degrees, is zero, wasn't it? All right, well, what about when this is at 180 or, one, or zero degrees? When they're at 180 degrees? Or at zero degrees, 
The cross product has a magnitude of zero. And actually that kind of makes sense to me because if, if you're asking me to come up with a vector that's perpendicular to both of my vectors and both of my vectors are just parallel to each other, then you haven't really well defined the problem, have you? If, if mine are like this together, then there are an infinite number of choices for the vector that would be perpendicular to both. So you haven't really, right? Whereas in the other situations, you actually have the uniquely determined it. Um, and the magnitude actually looks similar to, I don't know, the extra information, yay, extra information, okay. Um, the magnitude turns out to be this. Is it optional? This is the magnitude of the cross product, just like this is the dot product, right? Anyway. No, but I just thought you would like to know why why we're getting cosine and sine. We're getting maximum and mins with the cross product magnitude in different places than when we use them. Anyway. Um, the other thing to note, too, that this might actually matter in your life, Leo, okay? And that's if you cross AB, you get something different than if you cross BA, if you do B cross A. So it's not commutative, also. The cross product is not commutative, which is okay. It's not a problem. It's actually, it's almost commutative. It's, it's, this is, a, in mathematics, we call this if, this, if an operation has this property, we call it anti-commutative. It's going to have the same components, just opposite sides. You can try it, yeah. If I say do A cross B, then you do A cross B. Well, how would it, I don't know how else that is. Yeah, yeah, the problem has itself. Oh, yeah, there's an applet here you can click on on your own time. We, we're running short on time here. I don't want to do an example. Um, and it lets you just drag around two vectors and watch the cross product happen. It's kind of fun. All right, you ready to do one? Here we go. Oh, come on. We got to do one before we go. I'll write it out here. All right, these are all vectors here, of course. All right. So we're doing i times this negative 4, right? Or excuse me, negative 1, 2, 0, 4. That, that matrix right there. Minus this matrix here, right? 3, 2, negative 1, 4. And then k, block these off, 3, negative 1, negative 1, 0. You feel it? No, I don't. And then i times, what is this? Negative 4 minus 0. We're doing the product of the two diagonals. So negative 4 minus 0. There's, there it is. Our, there's our first component. Here we've got 12 minus negative 2, which is 14, but throw a negative out front. What's down here? 0 minus 1. So that's just negative 1. If you want to write, write 1, you can. So I think our cross product is negative 4, negative 14, negative 1. And what's one way that we could just kind of check that we got it right? Well, it's not a foolproof check. But it should be true that I claim that this has what property in relationship to each of the other, other ones? So you could try by checking the dot product of our cross product vector with either one of these. Check it real quick even in your head. You should get with both of the original vectors a dot product of zero, do you? Remarkable. Amazing. But true. Does it work? All right, hey guys, the homework tonight, this is guys, um, the homework sheet says do this worksheet. Uh, please feel free, I don't know whether it says this on there or not, but please feel free to do just the odds if you like, okay? I think you get the idea. If you want to do more, you can, but. It actually gives It does? It gives us front 1 through 11 odd, back 7, 8, 9, 11, 13, 15. Do what the worksheet says, there you go. Just know that you don't have to do them all, okay?
great day, you guys. See you later. Yeah. 